that uh, we were always in the front lines together back in um, back in the day. <laughs> and I, I know that uh, you're going to guide us and bring balance to our webinar today. So welcome, Nigam Miigwech. Um, you watch grandma and uh, for that wonderful introduction, although back in the day is like last week, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> so uh, it's an honor to, uh, you know, back in the day, I guess would be like pre COVID. So, you know, cause I mean, I really haven't seen anyone uh, other than, you know, on these little boxes on my screen. And so uh, it's a huge honor to be introduced by grandma. I mean, I have such tremendous respect for grandma, including, uh, you know, there was this beautiful CBC documentary about grandma, if you get a chance to go see it. Um, and uh, it's a radio documentary and about the work that grandma's done. So, you know, check it out if you can. Um, anyways, anyways, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to share with you the language of the territory and this place. I come to you uh, live from Treaty One territory here in Manitowoble, uh, this place, this beautiful place where the life comes from the water. And uh, the, uh, of course, Manitoapi, the, the teachings that are placed on the earth as well in this wonderful territory that we are in, uh, which have, my family has always been here in this beautiful place. Uh, we've never not been here. So I come from two different communities, from the Cree community of Norway House, uh, which is where my great grandfather comes from. And then my grandmother who comes from Manicatagan and then via Selkirk, which they met and, and settled in uh, St. Peter's Indian Settlement, which is now of course uh, inhabited, uh, occupied, invaded by the city of Selkirk. And that's where I grew up. And uh, that's where I spent all my life. And I'm a member of Pegwis First Nation. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, we're going to spend a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of discussions. We're going to have, there's a whole bunch of housekeeping things I want to do just at the beginning here, just to remind us uh, that if you could please just mute yourself during the uh, trajectory of this next 90 minutes, or I guess it's now 75 minutes. Uh, if you have any need for technical support, you can just uh, email, look at the email that's in the chat uh, for anyone that needs any assistance for anything. Uh, we are going to be logging the chat in this conversation. So, uh, and we are live streaming this on YouTube. So you will be able to access anything if for some reason that you've, uh, you know, you've got to leave a bit early or maybe you have some technical difficulties or whatever it might be. You will be able to see all the aspects of the conversation that is going to take place between our guests and our our speakers for tonight. And uh, unfortunately, we're not able to, due to lots of the uh, issues around the um, technical issues, as well as a number of other uh, things, we weren't able to have ASL interpretation for today's, today's event, but we're going to be having a transcript done and closed captioning will be added to the recording of this video for YouTube uh, for the future uploads. So, so for those of you that, uh, that uh, need that or want to pass that on to others who couldn't attend for tonight, we will have closed captioning. Um, so tonight what's going to happen is in the next few minutes, we're going to offer uh, our organizer, um, Leah Gazan, a opportunity to start us off for the night. And then what we're going to do is we're going to invite, we have uh, panelists, some amazing, outstanding panelists who are going to speak a little bit about their work and then also talk about the three questions, which is what the theme for tonight is. So if you take a look right now on your chat. And you can see here at the very top of your chat as you entered into the room here um, are from our wonderful host, Alana, who, let me tell you, has worked very hard. Uh, she's going to wave right now. Wave, Alana. Uh, and uh, she's worked very, very hard on tonight's event and, uh, you know, worked very hard with grandma and including uh, taking those of us who are disorganized like myself and making sure that we respond to the emails and come to the meetings and so on. So uh, tremendously persistent and talented. Uh, if you take a look at the questions, those are the three questions we're going to be talking about tonight. We're going to be talking a little bit about what are you hearing in your communities about how people are thinking and feeling about climate change. Uh, number two is how can we as a community work together to prepare for some of the changes that are projected to come about as a result of climate change. And then number three, what would a just transition look like in a community and what do we need to do to ensure that it is more equitable? Uh, so we're going to invite our, our, uh, our partners to, uh, to make some comments, some introductory opening comments. And then uh, after about 10 minutes each, uh, then we're going to have some times for dialogue at the end. And I'll lead some commentary and some questions uh, that we can do. 
uh, that we can discuss and um, and it's going to be a fantastic night of course it's probably going to go way too fast and we're going to not have availability to get to every topic that we can but if you do have some chat uh, some questions that you'd like to make you can make it through the chat so the comments or questions and what we'll do is we'll try to get to those as soon as we can uh, during the conversation element of the uh, of the conversation. Uh, so um, as I pull up my my page over here, um, I feel like, you know, me introducing uh, Leah is just a weird experience to me because I've known Leah for 40 years. You know, she used to beat me up when I was a kid. And now I got some time to talk about it right now. No, I'm just... <laughs> we've known each other since we were kids. Our parents were very close and uh, she was uh, someone who was tremendously generous throughout my entire life and my career. Uh, I've come into know Leah during various times in my life, including when the two of us went to university together to become actors, believe it or not. Uh, that was our first attempt at a career way back. And you remember that back in the day? <laughs> uh, yes, I'm I sure do, Nagon. <laughs> <laughs> and now look at Leah. She's uh, she, well, I want you to know that Leah was an outstanding student. I was not. Uh, and now Leah, of course, has done many different things. She's an educator and she spent her life working for human rights on the local, national, international stage. And, you know, to talk about all the different things that she did before, I mean, most of you probably know Leah by her work as an MP. You know, now she's an MP for Winnipeg Center. Uh, she's also the NDP critic for Children, Families and Social Development. And of course, introduced the Bill C-232, the Climate Emergency Act. And, and you know, lots of different things that she's done. Uh, fought for guaranteed livable income and uh, the emergency response benefit, to convert the emergency response benefit into that. Uh, she's Lakota from Treaty 4. But, you know, if you looked at all the things that, that Leah did, one of the things that I think Grandma talked about at the beginning, um, you know, the, I first got to know Grandma when we were marching on the streets together and we were uh, during Idle No More and we were out there uh, putting our bodies on the line, putting our voices out in the world and, and most importantly, stepping with our grassroots communities who were all standing up uh, against the omnibus legislations uh, to come and, you know, affect, that would affect water and take treaty territory forcibly and illegally. And, uh, you know, I, this is the time in which I got to march with Leah and I got to see Leah in her leadership role within the community. And there was a group of us that were uh, heading up Idle No More Winnipeg. Um, and there was many different people came in and out of that group. But Leah was a fixture in that group as a constant voice of, of uh, kindness, of generosity, and of most importantly, consistency. Someone who was always there at the first to arrive at the gathering and the last to leave to make sure that people were safe, that voices were heard. And probably most important of all is that we were we were doing things for the earth itself and we were doing it to think about the earth and so uh without uh without saying too much more about um never mind the fact that i was uh you know when i was asked or voluntold to do this event uh we all know that i couldn't say no to leah <laughs> so not only is leah a force in our community but you know it's like i just try to keep up with you that's your introduction there you go thank you Thank you, uh, Nigon. Always an interesting introduction with Nigon. No, thank you. Yeah, so I was much. nice for most of it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much to my uh, brother Nigon, uh, and uh, just want to start out by um, uh, you know uh, thanking uh, Alana and and Grandma uh, for you know I think envisioning it and and all the work and help from the uh, Mennonite Church of Canada, the Mennonite Central Committee, and of course, Kairos, um, you know, for organizing such an important discussion and a discussion about the earth um, during a pandemic at a time where we're not, I believe, talking enough about Mother Earth and how uh, even in the time in which we find ourselves uh, in a pandemic is directly related to the impacts of the climate uh, emergency. And just to uh, welcome my good sister, um, Ellen Gabriel, um, uh, Sadie uh, Lavoie. Uh, so good to see you, Sadie. It's been a, a minute. And uh, Kaki K, uh, voices uh, that have traveled across the country uh, in their own territories, uh, fighting for human rights, which includes uh, the right to a clean healthy uh, and safe environment as a human right, because we are 
at this very moment in a climate emergency and our very survival as humanity depends on the kind of respect uh, and nurturing that we provide to our mother earth, uh, to our waters. Um, one of the reasons why I put forward uh, Bill C-262 that actually unfortunately got voted down a couple of weeks ago, the climate action um, emergency framework, a framework uh, for transformative uh, climate action uh, rooted uh, in consultation, uh, keeping in line with taking all measures necessary to ensure that Canada respected its commitment under the Convention on Climate Change to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to do so while fully complying with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples because there will never be climate justice in this country without respecting the fundamental human rights of Indigenous peoples, many of whom are on the front lines uh, of the climate uh, emergency. And I can't think of any people better uh, to talk about these matters uh, than the people uh, that we have today, including, uh, I have to give a special uh, shout out to my good brother, Steve Heinrichs, who has literally put his body on the line in the fight for fundamental Indigenous human rights as a good ally, but also his body on the line of uh, fighting uh, to mitigate the impacts uh, of the climate emergency. Um, we have a big fight on our hands. I know that the government currently has Bill C-12 uh, that they put in place that will not meet climate targets. Uh, my bill that I proposed uh, would have met climate targets, uh, would have uh, been consistent with science, uh, would have been consistent with upholding the fundamental human rights of Indigenous peoples. We have to sound our voices at a time when we are in a climate emergency. And that's why uh, it's such a privilege to work with, uh, you know, Alana and Grandma initially in the office. Uh, Alana, who I've been gifted with as a, as a, a student, uh, intern in our office, and and the many people around the table today in, in work that I've done uh, throughout the years to have this critical discussion. So without further ado, I want to uh, invite the guests uh, to, to share their wisdom. And uh, I hope uh, that you find what you hear and what I've learned from these very fine individuals as inspiring as I do. Thank you so much. Miigwech, Leah, for that. Uh... We're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through uh, each speaker uh, and who's going to, uh, uh, in their own way, address the three questions, talk a little bit about their own work and also talk about the issue of the climate change emergency, some of the changes that we should pre be preparing for and then a little look to the future of what is it that a future might look like that would be equitable and that particularly would be more mindful of our, uh, of our relatives. And when I say our relatives, I'm thinking of Lake Winnipeg, I'm thinking of the air and I'm thinking of the sky and the, the earth and the, the wonderful, how the earth always cares for us. And sometimes we at times don't care as much in return. And so the key here is to think a little bit about uh, how, do, how is it that we, we're living, uh, moving together. And so I'm gonna introduce each one of our, uh, our speakers and then uh, as they finish, then I'll introduce the next speaker. So the first speaker that we have is uh, Kaki K. Uh, Thunder Sky. Yeah, it's, she's an Anishinaabe Quay with roots in Poplar River First Nation, uh, one of my favorite communities, by the way, Poplar River, just beautiful territory, Treaty 5. Uh, she's 22-year-old former kid uh, who was in care in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Treaty 1. Uh, she's also the mother of a beautiful two-month-old two baby girl. Uh, Kakike is a grassroots community helper, facilitator, and community organizer uh, who, uh, who works with a strength-based harm reduction and non-judgment approach, uh, who's volunteered also 
in the community for years, helping run community giveaways and gatherings with the themes of anti-violence, hope, land and water protection and harm protection. She's worked in lots of different areas, childcare, recreation and solidarity work with water and land defenders, Winnipeg, and has traveled across different territories, indigenous territories, uh, working on direct action approaches. She's also a member of the Red Rising Magazine Collective uh, and so, and the host of a, of a radio show on CKUW, the Inner City Voices. And probably, look at this, we've got already a guest facilitator <laughs> who, uh, who's joined us, so that's wonderful. Uh, Kaki K, go take it away. Uh, if you want to address some of the questions, and I know uh, if you have to stop for any reason, we can always come back to you. If you have to uh, you know, help out our new, our, our guest member, our guest visitor here. <laughs> uh, thank you. I guess I'm going to start. Um, Ani Buju, on the Dinaway Maganatok, Kakike Sunder Sky, Dijnakaz, Pop Urban and Duji, Shegwa Winnipegai, Benesi Dotem. Hello, my name is Kakike Sunder Sky. I come from Poplar River and Winnipeg as well. I'm a member of the Thunderbird Clan, and this is my daughter. Her name is Tokala Wachiwi. I was just nursing her. Um, but I'm passing her to her auntie, my sister, so I can talk and she can get some auntie love. <laughs> She's missing a sock. Um, so I just wanted to start off by thanking uh, grandma for that opening prayer and um, thanking all the organizers, um, Leah, and everyone, sorry, my mind's all over. <laughs> Very tiring days. Um, so to kind of answer those first questions, um, in communities that I am part of, um, I've been hearing a lot of unrest. Um, the topic of climate change is a much broader topic um, that is accompanied by other topics such as capitalism, white supremacy, patriarchy, and other issues. Um, I think it is crucial to address all the contributing factors to climate change when talking about climate change and possible solutions. Um, so with that being said, I don't want to speak for community and I can't. I can't speak for all youth. I can just speak as myself, which is an Indigenous youth uh, involved in climate action. So. In these conversations I've been a part of, I hear a lot of talk about responsibility. Um, growing up, I used to hear a lot of talk about our rights and our rights to this land. Uh, I've always heard people speak about how we have um, so many just rights and authorities and how that this has all been inherited. Um, but as of lately, I've been noticing a huge shift in these conversations, um, just in my personal life. And it's been shifting to responsibility um, and what responsibilities and what roles we play here to the land. Um, so that being said, I just wanna say that we inherited this land from our ancestors and we are borrowing it from our children um, that started to get a lot more meaning in my life personally uh, when I had my daughter here. And I started really thinking about that, uh, what I wanted to leave for her, what kind of future I wanted for her. So with that being said, you know, that's a huge responsibility that we have to hold ourselves accountable to. And I think that this shift came from a really strong component of spirituality and culture, because growing up, I was taught um, to look at ourselves as future ancestors and to live our lives knowing that we're going to be a future ancestor. So we need to be really cognizant of what we leave behind um, and knowing that you know, we have to be really intentional and strategic with how we move in this world. Um, you know, we have to say our prayers, but we also have to do the work. Uh, we have to meet our prayers halfway. And that's part of the responsibility. So um, that one question uh, to prepare, uh, I think the best way to prepare is to prevent. Um, you know, we come from the land, we are the land, um, and once that land is destroyed, you know, we're essentially destroyed. Um, we are the land protecting itself. Once that water is all gone, you know, we're gonna have nothing to drink when the sky is polluted, when the air is polluted. You know, we can't breathe. Um, 
which is really, you know, like basic, but that's just the best way I can answer that second question was that we don't really have a choice. We just have to prevent and stop it. Um, and there's no going back and there's no other options in my mind besides prevention. So earlier um, I mentioned the word unrest and what I meant by that is that a lot of youth I know are eager or have been eager to mobilize and organize in various different forms of direct actions. Um, there is a wide diversity of tactics and we have to respect all forms. Uh, so a lot of youth have been Mo who are mobilizing have been using tactics of direct actions such as railroad blockades, highway blockades, street blockades, occupations of offices, locking down buildings. Um, I believe that blockades are necessary in this type of work. Um, you know, every day you shut something down, you're delaying um, a work day for them. And that's very, very important. Um, so I guess I was gonna just provide some examples. Um, that things that I've been involved with and things that I've been seeing. Um, so uh, an example of some of the work that I've been involved with um, was around this time last year, maybe a little bit earlier, um, there was youth all across so-called Canada um, who took part in actions coast to coast to allegedly shut down Canada. Uh, in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en who were up against the CGL pipeline going through their territories without consent. Um, as you know, many of us know, and if you don't know, now you're gonna know, um, <laughs> the hereditary chiefs and the land defenders and the matriarchs out there on the West Coast were met with hostility and militant actions taken by the RCMP for standing up for their inherent rights to their territory. And that's wrong. Um, that just leaves, you know, like an ugly feeling that just leaves like a sour taste. Um, you know, it's just horrible watching that happen. Um, and I also believe that we all have, you know, responsibilities to be good relatives. So even though they're on the West Coast, you know, all across Canada, actions were happening. Uh, Canada was shook. <laughs> um, so uh, standing in solidarity with Indigenous Nation is climate justice work. Um, we see these big resource extraction projects going into territories that they aren't authorized to go into. You know, they don't have no permission, they got no consent. Um, these projects and industries are contributing to climate change in massive, massive giant ways. Um, here in Winnipeg, you know, last year around the time when everyone was shutting down Canada, there were multiple road blockades. Uh, there were round dances held throughout the, all the city. Uh, you know, we really made a lot of settlers really mad. Um, and you know, that's good. I don't really care that they're mad. Um, <laughs> uh, there was round dances held, you know, at banks that fund CGL, uh, the CGL pipeline. Um, and some of us youth, you know, we did a peaceful occupation at the Minister of Northern Affairs, Dan Vendel's office, demanding that, you know, he stand with the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs and that um, he denounced the actions taken by the RCMP, uh, which didn't end up happening, unfortunately, which is a huge shame. Um, but all this work and all these efforts being put to stand in solidarity to protect the land is crucial work uh, to revise climate change or reverse revise. I don't want to revise that. <laughs> um, so here in Winnipeg, you know, we do a lot of solidarity uh, work as urban indigenous people and youth. Um, you know, we could still do climate justice work um, just because you're in the city for whatever reason. Um, yeah. you know, and just because we're on this land that has concrete on it doesn't mean it's not sacred and doesn't mean that we can't be impactful and intentional with our work here, um, even though we're so far away. Uh, you know, these government bodies and these corporations who are responsible for the destruction of the lands have offices and headquarters in cities all over Canada, all over so-called Canada. There's offices everywhere. Um, and, you know, just takes a few friends to go shut that down and raise your concerns, raise your voices. Um, allegedly, of course. <laughs> um, so not all of my work has been just standing in solidarity from afar. 
Uh, I've been fortunate enough to travel to different frontline and resistance camps. Um, the one camp that I visited most frequently was the Tiny House Warriors Camp. Um, I was there this past summer when I had my baby in my tummy and I spent like two months there. Um, it was really beautiful and that was really important to me just to be out there um, while I still could. Um, I wasn't showing yet and I think it was good energy <laughs> for my little baby to develop too. That's just a personal side note. Um, so this, the Tiny House Warriors Camp uh, is out on the West Coast uh, in so-called British Columbia on unceded um, Sequamic territory. Uh, the Tiny House Warriors, for those of you who don't know, are uh, tiny houses built as warriors on the path of a pipeline. Um, that pipeline being the federally owned TMX, which is formerly Kinder Morgan. Um, which is crossing through their territory without consent. Um, so this camp brings up a lot of other issues that come along with these big corporations and these big industry. Um, so the camp is located on a proposed site for a man camp. Um, so for those of you who don't know, a man camp is just the camp where all the men go who are working on these projects. Sounds kind of gross. Um, <laughs> So violence uh, to the land, you know, brings violence to our bodies and our communities. These man camps are linked to increasing numbers of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Um, that is known, that has been known. So the fact that these are continuing is just absolutely disgusting and just proves that they just don't care, that they just don't care about, um, you know, our bodies. Um, you know, we are the land we come from the land, we got our languages from the land, we got so much from the land, just our way of life, our livelihood, everything. Um, so when you hurt the land, you're hurting the people. Um, so Tiny House Warriors has successfully stopped, you know, that violence from entering their territories um, with this one camp. Um, so I guess, it's kind of switching gears a little bit, um, but I felt this was really important. Um, another thing I would like to mention is um, we would be doing a huge disservice to Indigenous land and water defenders if we don't mention violence and uh, incrimination faced while uh, we're inserting our inherent rights. Um, for climate change solutions, it is crucial that we abolish the police that inflict uh, violence upon us. Um, you know, when you're doing this work, a lot of times people, as we see, you know, are just being thrown in jail. Um, they're being, they, they, get, they get so many more barriers placed upon them, you know, court, they try to prolong uh, court hearings. They try to put as many obstacles as they can in front of you to prevent you from continuing this work, putting you in jail so you can't do this work um, and inflicting a lot of fear into people. I know here in Manitoba, we have, that proposed act, um, that protest act. Can't really think too much right now. I'm kind of all over the place, I'm a little tired. Um, so with that being said though, I would like to acknowledge that tomorrow marks one year since a 16 year old Aisha Hudson was shot by the Winnipeg police. Um, despite that not necessarily being a climate issue, you know, it still shows that, um, oh yes, yeah, someone wrote it in the comments. Thank you, uh, Bill uh, 57. Um, but despite that not being necessarily a climate issue, you know, it still contributes to the ongoing genocide being experienced here in so-called Canada, um, you know, just simply existing, um, you know, can be scary sometimes, um, especially being an urban youth, you know, or not especially just being a youth, an Indigenous youth in Canada, you know, and it's exhausting. So for the last question, I guess, um, a just transition doesn't only just apply to workers. Um, you know, it's cleaning up your mess and giving the land back. Um, land back is autonomy over our lands, waters, bodies, and families. It's respecting and insert, asserting and honoring indigenous sovereignty and authority. Um, you know, it must, a just transition must also include uh, human rights being met. You know, for too long, Canada used uh, coercion tactics to gain access to land and resources. Um, you know, there can be no free prior and informed consent while there are still boiled, uh, boiled water advisories. Um, so the last thing I wanna say 
is Lan back and uh, Miigwech for listening. Uh, miigwech, Kaki, Kaki K. Uh, your uh, amazing inspirational fear, fear and fierceness at the same time is uh, is certainly a reminder a lot of uh, the tremendous value of the of our sisters in our community and the work that, that you do and uh, uh, miigwech for all of that. And I guess for all your travel and dedication to our communities. I mean, just a remarkable, just a remarkable uh, amount of travel that you've done at such a young age. And, uh, and you know, already I can see your daughter is uh, got really a beautiful life around her. And uh, as someone who's a father of a daughter myself, I can really appreciate how uh, when we hold up the earth for our daughters and for our sons, uh, they really are surrounded by love. And so uh, miigwech for that. Uh, let's go to Sadie Phoenix Lavois. So I've known Sadie for quite a long time. Uh, and since uh, Leah and grandma and I were all uh, walking in I don't know more, Sadie was also one of the organizers and and uh, just a innovative voice of in I don't know more Winnipeg and the group that were, was all of us. Uh, she's uh, they's from the Saging First Nation on Treaty One. Uh, they graduated in 2017 at the University of Winnipeg with the Bachelor of Arts in Indigenous Studies and Political Science. Uh, I mean, listing off all the different things here is just kind of a, a crazy thing for me because I, I just know you so well, Sadie. And I mean, if I could list off all the different things, I talk about your work as a graphic designer, your use, your work as an activist uh, with the Youth Green Action, uh, mentor on Youth Agencies Alliance, uh, being a co-founder of Red Rising Magazine, uh, Sadie, you know, the thing that I want to say congratulations for, because we haven't really talked a lot since the pandemic, is just that you've uh, you received awards from the University of Winnipeg. I think it was the Tobasonaquit Canoe Award. And, uh, you know, congratulations on that. And also you, alongside the same ceremony uh, with the Social Justice Studies Association of Canada, uh, it was actually Peace and Justice Studies Association from Georgetown awarded you the Next Generation Peacemaker Award. Uh, as well. And so Sadie, uh, the work that you do is remarkable. It's so nice to see you. Uh, last time I think I saw you was in a coffee shop downtown. I think that was like two years ago, <laughs> even though we're, we're uh, but it's really nice to see you, Sadie. Uh, take it away. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just want to say miigwech to everybody and, and thank you, Nigon, uh, for the intro and uh, to Grandma Shingu, Sintalia, um, and Kaki K for, for sharing your words so far and excited to hear from Ellen, uh, one of my biggest inspirations um, growing up. Um, so I'll just say Anin, Buju, Tanse, Migazi, Ganawa, Benijige, Indishnakas, Segi, Niduji, Meknekto, Dem. My name is Sidi Phoenix. Um, <clears throat> I'm from Segi First Nation, Treaty One. Um, I'm a member of the Turtle Clan. Um, I also am two-spirited and I go by they, them pronouns. Um, so yeah, I just want to acknowledge, you know, I'm here in Treaty One territory, um, the land of the Anishinaabe and the Nehewa, um, the Oji Cree, Dene, um, the Kota, and the homeland of the Metis. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that we're also here on Turtle Island that connects a lot of us uh, Indigenous folks uh, coast to coast to coast. Um, so I just, I just want to say thank you for everybody for, for speaking so far and um, giving me inspiration to, to kind of get me into the mindset of what I'm going to say. Um, I wasn't sure too much about, uh, I usually kind of just let things flow. <laughs> That's kind of my motto. Um, but, uh, you know, I appreciate hearing, you know, what, uh, what Kaki has to say about a lot of the work that, uh, you know, she has done. Um, and I've been, you know, inspired and watched um, and supported, you know, her journey. And I only am so excited to be the auntie to Kala and get to see to Kala grow. And, um, you know, and, and, and I'm just really happy and I'm just excited to see the, the mother that she's becoming and the little matriarch that she's, uh, she's, she's raising. So, um, yeah, <clears throat> you know, and then I think that's just a huge reminder for the whole reasoning for why we do the work that we do around climate change. It's always about the, the next generation 
um, and the future. And, you know, we really have to, to think about them. And um, I don't have kids of my own. So this is like, you know, it's always a constant reminder that, you know, I, I sacrifice myself to, for a lot of things. And um, I, knowing that I'm the work that I'm putting in helps, you know, the future for, for Dakala and for all the other little ones out there. Um, they help me keep me going. <laughs> so I guess, um, I guess just to get right into it. Um, I know Nigon was kind of talking a little bit about some of the stuff that I've done. Um, I feel really weird every time somebody says my bio. So it's easier just to like kind of <laughs> breeze past most of it and just say, Hey, I'm here. Um, but yeah, I, I did a lot of activism work, uh, community act advocacy work here in Winnipeg. Um, since I don't know more, I don't know more was kind of my wake up call. Um, and it kind of helped kind of kickstart me on my journey. Um, who I was as a two spirited person, a young person, somebody who, you know, had a thirst for knowledge and somebody who wanted to basically, um, you know, put myself forward as somebody to, to do, you know, frontline work uh, or to do conversations around racism or anything like that. Um, because like, I just, for me personally, I felt like I just, I couldn't live in a world where I didn't do nothing to make it better. Um, and so ultimately I've spent a lot of years uh, figuring out the best way I can be a support system or to figure out how to find deficits and try to, to make them better. Um, and to kind of, yeah, I guess address white supremacy as a whole. And I think really when we talk about climate change, white supremacy is pretty much at the heart of that. Um, so anything that's addressing white supremacy, I think, has some type of like uh, like linkages to addressing climate change in some way. Um, and that, you know, climate change continues on is because of the permanent white supremacy continues on. Um, and this has to deal with racism. This has to deal with, like, you know, the history of colonialism um, and globalization uh, of like economies. And, um, you know, it's I think that really. When we when we talk about white supremacy, um, you know, we see it as a bigger issue, not just for ourselves, but for BIPOC folks as well um, and Indigenous folks all over the world. Um, and then, you know, that really strengthening our solidarity with Black, Indigenous people of color all over the place, um, because they're also dealing with climate change because climate change affects all of us, you know, and it's really getting to like the broader aspects of things. And then, you know, then you realize that there's capitalism involved and patriarchy and you know, all these other structures and ideologies that are up, up, being upheld by that. Um, and so any effort to kind of tackle all of those things, you know, down the line does address climate change. So I, I just want to say that everybody that does that work is still contributing to, you know, addressing climate change in some way. Um, so that's just a disclaimer, I guess, is one way of putting it. But, um, you know, I, I've been on the fence of like, uh, you know, trying to figure out how um, what does this just transition look like um, in terms of, you know, how do, how do we work together as a community? Um, a lot of us now, I feel like we're going through this phase of inward looking of, um, you know, how am, how am I being complicit? How can I be a better support or an ally? Um, even as somebody that holds uh, you know, that has been oppressed or, you know, I still hold privileges um, and being able to position myself and figure out, you know, um, how I can be most helpful. Um, I think a lot of people are starting to realize that, you know, not just living minimally or just being conscious buyers is, is the only, the only way you can be sustainable and the only way that you can address climate change, that there's other things that you need to do. And a lot of those things are coming from a privileged choice you know, some people don't get that option. Um, and so it's having to be mindful of a lot of those things, but knowing that they still can help to the broader thing, but not to, to leave it at that. Um, I think a lot of people, when we talk about oil or fossil fuels are like, well, you buy, you buy cars, you drive and do this. And it's like, okay, well, we're not, I'm not leaving it. The solution shouldn't leave at me being a conscious buyer. It should, it should contribute to the production. It contributes to the government policies that put you know, uh, 
that basically cut away red tape in order for them to to do what they want it's talking about environmental protections and you know um and so there has to be a linkage to you know the ways that i live my life as an individual and how i'm contributing to society as a collective and being collective mind collectively mindful of a lot of things and how i make my individual choices um so that's just kind of more of the opening, I guess, in one way. And when, when the question is raised about like, you know, how, how we as a community work together and prepare for those changes that are going to come from climate change, you know, the, a lot of them are, you know, we, yes, we have to educate ourselves and yes, we have to support, you know, by through funding for local organizations or, you know, trying to do our own work in our inner work and doing policy interventions um, and mobilizing p- public um, public attention who are not paying attention <laughs> um, and direct that around the economy. You know, our economy is completely based on extractive ideologies, exploitive um, capitalism and based on profit, you know, and we really need to shift the way that we function as a country, as a society and as a community um, and how uh, we really need to figure out a whole new model of how to how to engage together um, that is intersectional that respects indigenous sovereignty that gives land back you know um, that understands the historical real like realizations of you know how things are <laughs> the way things are and what what we need to do as a community to be solidarity for for BIPOC folks as well in terms of health and access um, so. I guess um, the other thing, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about is, you know, in the future, especially is our access to um, like clean water. I think that clean water is like one of the major issues that's going to be our, it's going to be a, the biggest issue of our time um, and, and how that's directed to health. And I think during this whole pandemic, I think we were starting to realize, you know, how much uh, of an, yeah, how much there's um, there's so much inequality when it comes to access to health, healthcare, um, and even in the healthcare system, the the care that we receive is also um, unequal because of racism or patriarchy. Um, and so, I guess when you think about it on a global level, like the water crisis is becoming a hu- bigger, bigger issue as uh, as we as we talk about climate change. And so, the portfolio. So the topic of indigenous rights and the rights of water are another thing that we need to be thinking about, the legalities of that and how um, Canada is obviously going to try to stifle that conversation. It's going to, um, you know, do what it can, do what it can in the meantime to ensure that we can't voice uh, or, or interject um, their, you know, their agenda, their colonial agenda. Um, cause for me, like sustainability is pretty much a whitewashed version of like, you know, the indigenous relationship to the environment that they're trying to live, live within. And so they're going to use that as a way of greenwashing their efforts. Um, and, you know, Trudeau tries to do that already with his climate plan of, you know, we're going to buy pipelines, but we're going to like talk about whales on the coast and, you know, certain things like that. So I think it draws people's attention away and, and that's going to be a tactic that the government's going to continue to use is, is to greenwash things and to whitewash things in a way that um, allows, you know, Canadians to be like, oh, that's exciting. Um, but they don't see the consequences of that or the, 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 the outcome of that um, that affects Indigenous peoples or affects BIPOC folks. And so that's why we need to be able to be... Um, you know, being able to mobilize, come together and, and put a political pressures on the government to say, hey, this is not the way to do things. Um, and so that's why it's super scary when the PC government's introducing legislation that, that, you know, wants to put us in jail, you know, and then we have to talk about the prison system. We got to talk about incarcerations. We talk about abolishing police and how that's also part of the conversation around addressing climate change. And how the government uses militancy to, to, to basically criminalize us and to silence us um, and, and then to, to, to label us as criminals, to label us as anti, 
you know, progress or anti anything. It's basically, yeah, like what this John guy saying, like gaslight in the public. And, you know, when I, I literally cried when I saw the legislation, I was freaking out on my case. So 30 days in jail, five grand for every day that you, you um, stop or blockade um, and, and voice your concern. And so um, really I'm trying to think of like, you know, for one, it, this, uh, this legislation is coming from because they know that what we're doing is working. They know that us targeting, uh, you know, the railways or the highways is actually costing them money and it's causing a lot of economic pressure on them. And so we know it's working. So there is some good thing that can come out of that. However, you know, we know that um, they use certain procedures in order to kind of funnel all of this legislation through um, and and to silence the public um, as those are tactics. And so... Um, ultimately it's just, you know, we have to be able to challenge those things. We need to challenge government that, um, wants to be undemocratic, uh, doesn't want us to have our, our rights. Um, and that we need to be brave too, to be able to, to put ourselves in places to say, do I really value my voice enough to put myself in those positions? And that's the scary thing is that the government's making us put this, put our livelihoods at, at stake putting, um, knowing that we have to risk and sacrifice our well-being just to ensure that, um, you know, we have a future to look towards. Um, and that's what's so scary is because this government really does not care um, and will do anything it can. It will literally put us in jail to ensure that it continues on the status quo. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I think when we think about just transitioning, um, like in the community, you know, we need to think about land back. Obviously that's a big, that's a big thing. We need to understand that indigenous peoples never gave up anything, um, that everything was taken, um, but we're still here. And so we're gonna, we, it's ours. And we just need to like, not ask for permission to acknowledge that. It's always been ours. We have always been here. You know, um, I think that the other conversation that we need to talk about is, you know, cash back. A lot of the monies that Canada has has created, like, you know, extracted all these industries, you know, we um, we are dealing with poverty, like state-induced poverty, and um, cash back, I think, highlights a lot of that, um, how much they've taken from our lands and our abilities to give that back you know, funding programs, social programs and stuff. Um, You know, it's talking about defunding and refunding, um, divesting from fossil fuels and investing in renewables, et cetera. You know, the whole cash back, it's it's using the money in a a strategic way um, that actually supports, you know, uh, where we want to do, what we want to do. And that it's it's grassroots led or indigenous led or BIPOC led. Um, Because we know what our needs are in the community to address and mitigate adapt from the, the result of climate change. Um, and part of that is, yeah, um, our lands are still, have been stolen, um, that there's cops on our lands um, and that they're throwing us in jail. Um, and so we need to have those conversations. And I think we're just really just scratching on the surface because we become reliant on a lot of these systems that have hurt us. Um, and we need to figure out better ways of creating alternatives um and yeah we need funding for that we need support for that and we need to not be i guess uh bullied and pushed around and uh villainized or victimized um throughout all of that um and because ultimately they needed us they need us to fix this problem (laughs) around uh climate change like they they don't know how to fix it. They never, they never know how to. Um, they've relied on indigenous peoples all over the world to fix these problems. Um, you know, the fact that indigenous lands carry 85% of the biodiversity out in the world and we're only make up 5% of the population. You know, we're literally doing the work of protecting the future for them. Um, and the thing is, is that we're starting to realize is that do they even want a future at this point? Like, do they even care about it? Um, and the sad, 
the sad answer is that it's no. So should we care about people who don't care about the environment? We should be collecting with people who do and, and creating our stronger voice. And part of that is, you know, going global and, and being solidarity and with, with other communities um, and branching out. Um, and understanding how we are complicit to, to, to the harms that they have gone through um, globally. Um, because even as somebody here, as an Indigenous person here that's impressed by Canada, I'm still oppressing other communities that I don't even know yet. So I have to be mindful of those things. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's just, that's just the way it, it is about being, trying to be a better person and trying to figure out how, how you can do things better. And, <laughs> um, it's kind of writing, yeah, addressing some of the just shortfalls that um, things that we haven't done yet, um, because that's part of equity. Um, you know, it's not always not always equal, but we have to respond um, to other people's oppression. But yeah, so it's just I always constantly question myself: are my wa are my wants, you know, coming at a cost that I don't bear? But um, and even that's a common question you can ask anybody, and so me wanting to get home after work, but I'm getting blockaded by a protest rally at Portage and Maine, you know, um, are, are, my, are my wants like being cost by somebody, something that I don't bear? Like, um, I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's, I think people need to put themselves outside of their shoes in order to see things differently. And um, a lot of people have been kind of yeah, just been blinded this whole time um, and or willfully ignorant. And once they start realizing that they've been impacted this whole time and that they'll continue to be impacted until they do something, then maybe then they'll they'll feel it in their hearts to want to do something about it. But, um, you know, right now, I think we need to continue to do these these solidarity actions. We need to continue to do these blockades or these sit ins to get the public pressure like those we can't stop doing any of those things because people are still being criminalized. You know, you have youth braided warriors getting jailed. You have, um, you have the line three, can you connect the flag in the States who are getting uh, incarcerated? So all these things are things that are, are ongoing, but you know, we don't feel them here because we're not there, but they still affect us and, and we need to act. Um, and you know, me being here, I've always been trying to like get people to to feel invested in and in wanting to do something or, or to talk about it. Um, but also I know that my voice is only one one voice, like, and I, I don't speak on behalf of any, everybody. Um, I only try to do my best and try to fulfill my role as best as I can. Um, and I guess, yeah, I, I just kind of want to showcase, you know, what is, what is the reality? What is, what is the truth that's happening? And, um, you know, it's a privilege to be able to talk about these issues. Um, and I'm constantly mindful of my responsibility. Um, you know, I realize that our bodies are constantly being surveilled. And that's a reality for a lot of people who have been doing this work for a long time is that, you know, our, not, our names are thrown around all the time. And so, like, it's, it's no surprise that the cops also start monitoring us. And so we have to be careful about the work that we do. And we have to be careful about how we say things on social media and, you know, either, you know, um, because, yeah, our existence alone is, is violence to the colonial system you know, uh, and so they respond with violence because that's the language they know. Um, and so our, and so this nonviolent direct action through either highway blockades and stuff like that is necessary because that's the language they know. Um, but we're not doing it in a violent way that's hurting anybody, you know, we're doing it in an economic way. And I think that's the important part because that's the only language that they understand is money uh, and exporting. <laughs> resources to get more um so you know we are the reminder that they failed colonialism um and they're they're just trying to maintain that colonial agenda through our resources and you know they don't want to have to re redress 
you know, they they want to avoid the redress of all of that reconciliation because they don't they they don't have control of it. They don't have control of reconciliation. You know, even when they try to, we took it back and we're saying, no, 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 you know, you're not, you're not doing it right. And so that's the thing is basically ensuring that we maintain control of the conversation and the narrative around, you know, climate change, capitalism, economy, um, because it directly affects us and our livelihoods and our future. Um, And yeah, I mean, once you start realizing that the government starting to be militant against grandmothers and youth, I think that, you know, as Canadians need to question it and to challenge their their support for uh, a colonial state that literally values oil above life. I mean, you just need to ask yourself that question and see where you are at in terms of being passive, active, or complicit. But yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Chi Miigwech. Great. So Miigwech, Sadie, uh, for all that and, and for uh, uh, reminding us of the real life, so much of the real life uh, impacts of all of these work and how uh, there's such, I mean, there when we're putting ourselves on the line for this work, so much of uh, when we're criminalized, it affects so many different m- impacts that's going on. And so, yes, police have to do with climate change. Yes, uh, justice and traffic and controls and all these d- elements uh, go- relate to climate change. I mean, really brilliant way that you've connected all of that together. Um, our final speaker is uh, someone who perhaps needs no introduction, but I'm going to try to encapsulate Ellen's co- accomplishments in a uh, in a <laughs> in a in a, in a short, we, I mean, we don't want to, I don't want to spend time introducing, I spend the rest of the time just talking about all the accomplishments that you've done from everything from back in the days of uh, being a spokesperson at OCA to all the work that you've done uh, in land protection, in water protection, uh, working with the Indigenous Climate Action Group, uh, even working with the Quebec Native Women's Association uh, you know, working at the United Nations in, in Indigenous human rights and environmental activism, you know, constantly working uh, internationally as well as locally within your own community. Uh, and I think about how it's not just all these accomplishments that you've done, but you, in many ways, Ellen, um, I don't think I'm speaking alone here when I say that you've raised many of us. And whether you know it or not, you have been an anti and a guiding force and a mentor to all of us in that the work that we do. And I can remember coming up to you at a national event for the TRC and uh, uh, just <laughs> how uh, you were walking, you were, I think you were doing some shopping in the some of the local craft people and how, uh, you know, even then in all of that, I, I asked you for advice and you graciously didn't, even though I didn't even know who I was, uh, gave me your time and your energy. And that's the kind of work that you do for all of us. You've really, you know, you've really raised a generation of people who are here tonight as well as elsewhere. Uh, and so a huge miigwech to, from me personally, my family, as well as for many of the people that are here tonight. So Ellen, uh, uh, take it away, go ahead. Um, what can we do? Grandma, she no hota wasan hoto ko ki no hota tawat tawat kani sa ane ki sa unsara de thano mahanto kataswa wakat unzone ji de chiti no varado de de chiti no varado na na ete istaun hota de chiti no varado na na ako ako te dawan de thano de chiti no varado na sungoy ati so de chiti no varado oni na na kasat sa sara sa ayera nyawa ji dasko karawi so uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for inviting me, for Alana, for her patience, to Leah, for um, just being an awesome person and, and advocating for everybody, not just Indigenous people. Uh, thank you, Kakeka, and uh, to Sadie for your words said before me and to Nigan for um, uh, touching my heart uh, just before I speak uh, to, to, um, to say that I've been an auntie to, to um, so many people. It's, it's, been a, it's been a great honor and a privilege. 
Um, my work spans three decades and, um, you know, the, the whole year, the whole time that I've been doing this, I've met so many wonderful people and amazing people who have taught me. And um, I've, I'm an introvert by nature. Um, you know, the pandemic for me is like, okay, I have an excuse to be in my cocoon. Um, so, but that's just to say that I, I think I used to be a good listener. I'm not sure, so sure if I'm a good listener anymore. Um, but listening to elders who have since passed and knowing that, you know, this is 500 years of resistance and those colonizers are not budging. And they're not budging because the same thing that motivated them back then to commit genocide against indigenous people is the same thing that is preventing us from progressing on, on this issue of climate change that is affecting not just human beings, but all species around this planet. And that is greed. It is plain old greed. And, you know, there have been, um, I, I'll, I'll just say evil players that have infiltrated various democracies around the world uh, who have kept, in, you know, not just indigenous people, but everybody uh, under their control. They decide what the fashion is. They're going to decide the, the price of gasoline. They're going to decide who world leaders will be. If you look at the United Nations, you know, the majority of leaders are men. Uh, the UN is a really good buffer for people who are advocating for human rights simply because uh, in it, you have a lot of wonderful documents of international human rights that talk about the inherent dignity of a person, not just indigenous people, but just a, a person in general and looking at that. You have wonderful things that talk about protection of human rights for languages, culture. Um, but when it comes to the actual environment, um, it's a bit wishy-washy. I mean, the Paris Accord, everybody likes to say it was such an accomplishment, but I don't think so. I think the Paris Accord is just another way for people who are causing the destruction of the environment to pat themselves on the back, to say, look, we participated in this, we agreed to the wording in this, and thank you for letting us decide when we're ready, we're gonna actually do something about it. Well, the UN came out with a report that we have six years, and that was, you know, that was in December. We have six years to do something, to make the actual changes so that that little, that little girl that we saw at the beginning of this, Kakeka's daughter, that she's gonna have something to, to work with, uh, to, to, to be able to sustain herself. Climate change is causing desertification. We see monocultures that are creating uh, threats to uh, species, to the environment, to indigenous plants, indigenous medicines. Um, we, we, we don't even know, like we've seen tiny, tiny bit of what we know is happening in the world's oceans. The world is mostly water. 3% of that, I think is 3% that is actually drinkable water. And so we're relying on, you know, we're using that water that we drink in our sewage, we're treating that water, and then we're drinking that water. And, and so we live in a really upside down world. In an upside down world that, you know, indigenous people were trying to tell settlers from the very beginning, you can't keep doing this. And when I say we stand on the shoulders of those indigenous peoples who were disrespected, um, their knowledge from 500 years ago is still relevant today. And if we look at just the world in general, they understood there, there's an indigenous science that meets the science of today in which people are relying on climate change data for. And it's all about the very basic elements that we see, the air, the water, um, fire, uh, fire. We know that the, the sun is the one that controls really the Earth's weather. This is a planet that is made up mostly of water. So the winds will carry that water everywhere. That's how those currents go are going. And why climate change is going, and this is where the topsy-turvy stuff is going. So you have the, the jet streams, right? We all have, know the jet streams. 
And what climate change has done, instead of these jet streams that have a normal and flow, it's going like this, right? So we get we get freezing rain in, in January and it's warm and then it goes back to you know minus 20 degrees. Uh, I grew up at a time, um, let's say I was a really young, I was really young when John F. Kennedy was shot, when Mar Martin Luther King was around, uh, when all, you know, the American Indian movement, I was too young for that. Um, but it, it got me inspired. And as I, as I get older and over these years, I see that we are just, we are being fooled. We are being fooled by the very people that we think we trust, which are the leaders of every single nation that's in this. I mean, we, they just got rid of in the South, someone who is denying climate change. And we're doing a disservice to, to the, that baby, her children and grandchildren. Um, but we still have to try, as, as Sadie and Kakeka uh, mentioned, as, as Negan and Leah uh, talk in, in, in the work that they do. This is all about economics. This is not about human rights. We can, we can push human rights in, their, in these people who are controlling the world into their faces. But unless it's the actual people, like everybody rises up together to meet that challenge and to force the 1% of the 8% to say, we're not taking it anymore. Like we saw with Black Lives Matter after the murder of George Floyd. We will do something, we can push back. It, it can't just be about protests though. It can't just be about, we're gonna to go to this protest. Sure, we need bodies at those protests, but we also need to change the mindset and the curriculum that is in schools. We need to hold accountable all those politicians who are making bribes we need to stop the lobbyists who are going to government to promote the oil companies or to promote the kind of pharmaceutical companies that we see that have created the havoc, I think, I think it's them, that, that we see today where we cannot visit each other. Uh, so we, you know, the Millennium Development Goals talks about poverty, but yet they still refuse to re re release the purse strings, they still refuse to to uh, support bills like Leah has for uh, guaranteed income for everybody so that everybody in the wealthiest countries can at least have a certain standard and quality of life. And when we think about what climate change is doing, it seems really abstract. And for climate refugees, like in the Pacific Islands, it's really real for them. And so you have countries like the US who are refusing climate, climate change refugees, which, is, which to me is like, this is the topsy-turvy world that we are living in. And um, you know, someone said that the earth, uh, the, you know, the earth doesn't understand time the way we do. She, she, she deals in billions of years and we're a really a young species and yet we have been the most destructive species there's so many extinctions that are going on as we speak. There's so many extinctions that, that of, of, of things, uh, creatures that, you know, when we do stuff, um, before we do meetings of the Haudenosaunee, uh, we do what's called Ahantikari Wetekwa, and we thank from the waters, the earth, the people, you know, the, the trees, everything like right to, to the sky. It's because when we make decisions, we need to be mindful of them. We are speaking on their behalf. And, and Sadie, you're a sister of mine because I'm Turtle Clan too. So we're, we're a family, you and I. <laughs> um, but we, when we talk about things, indigenous people took those roles seriously. And what, and what colonization did was take that away from us. They took our language away. They took our children away. They're, they're stealing our land still. Nothing has changed. Uh, no matter what the rhetoric is in government, nothing has changed. We are still in the same situation as we were in 1990, in 1996, when the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples came out and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We're still in the exact same position. We see youth rising, but youth have always been rising. It's, not, it's nothing new for youth to rise. What youth need to do is to listen to those elders who have that wisdom to listen, as I did when I was younger. Um, 
And like I said, I'm not such a good listener anymore because as you get older, you kind of like, okay, that's it. My patience has run out. <laughs> and after menopause, you have an excuse. So, um, <laughs> um, but I, I think, you know, this is, this is, it comes down to really, really simple things for indigenous people. Uh, and, and anybody who has a critical mind will, will, will understand that this is all about energy. I'm not talking about resource energy. I think it's about our energy, the vibrations that we give out. It's kind of like that, you're simplifying it as like karma. And if we are not doing something for, for this generation and future generations, and if we don't understand where we've come from in the past, we are going to be making those same mistakes. And we're not giving a chance to those, those children and the future generations to be able to survive in a planet that's going to get hotter, to survive in a planet where there's going to be less food and people are going to be fighting. People are going to be fighting for water. They're going to be fighting for food. How are we going to protect ourselves? Where are we going to get the food if we're scared to leave our homes? We are traditionally horticulturalists and agriculturalists as the Haudenosaunee people, corn, beans, and squash, the three sisters, complete protein. If you're, if you don't have, you know, the, the, the deer and the moose to hunt, complete protein. Um, you know, the UN starts putting things in categories of what are the pillars of, of changing, you know, the world and in climate change and environmental protection, water conservation, fisheries, renewable energy, and it goes on and on and on. But they forget these, these are, these are all about meeting human beings needs. This is not about meeting the needs of all our relations that indigenous people's philosophies have talked about for many, many generations. This is multiple generations. So I can tell you that the green energy is, is a buzzword. So when, like in my community, uh, the rich ones who are getting rich off the marijuana sales, uh, they're buying Teslas. This is their contribution to climate change. You know, and you know, it's really important for people to understand that electric cars require mining. And right now there's an Atikamek uh, community fighting that. Uh, I forget what the mineral is in their community, but it's used to make electric cars. In my community, they want to open up a, an old uranium mine that closed in 1980, went bankrupt conveniently and left a sludge of toxic waste behind. Um, Niobium used to harden metal for the space station and for, you know, metal tanks. Uh, everywhere in indigenous people's territory, it's not enough that they put us on reserves, but they find stuff on the reserves to take from us and they divide and conquer. And, and so it's not about the leadership. You know, for me, the leadership has failed us as well because they are dependent on the government to rubber stamp and approve whatever they're doing in exchange for funding or services for the community. A lot of band councils are service providers. They're not really able to make those decisions that would protect our lands. So in my community, there's a toxic waste dump and it smells to high heaven. And it's from two individuals from my community. And so it's really deceptive to talk about Indigenous people, you are so, you, you, you protect the land, you're so good with nature. Yeah, but we're colonized too. Just like most Canadians and Quebecois are colonized. So it's about that mind change and to try and understand the kind of terminology that has been used to oppress us and continues to oppress us with a green economy. Uh, what is sustainable? Can we imagine a world that where we're really sustainable? Uh, can we live without our phones? Can we live without electricity? I don't, I think the majority of world would say no, because then how are we going to freeze our food? Um, a green economy, well, what is a just transition it means you're going to respect the voices of indigenous women, the women leaders who have been out there making change. They made changes to the Indian Act and they're continuing to make changes. Um, we have to provide uh, equal opportunity for people to be able to buy as, as consumers, that's never going to stop, as consumers to be able to buy products that are kinder and gentler and recycling their products. 
uh, you know, you get an, a little USB key like this and you got to package this big. You know, it's just like your, your tiny little cars you buy for your boys, you have packages this big and then it's not recycled because not everywhere has the opportunity to recycle. So I think, uh, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm talking too long here, but um, there's just something that uh, I was listening to David Suzuki once uh, talking and he said something really interesting, which I think our ancestors knew anyways. And he was talking about the air and the biosphere. And he said, the air that we breathe today is the same air that the dinosaurs were breathing. And what we're doing is destroying that little layer of the biosphere that protects us from the sun's rays and provides us with that cushion of that radiation that is out there. And I think that's, that's the way we need to think about it. This is an ancient planet. I don't think we even know how old it is, but we're a young species. And as a young species, we need to start listening to the earth. We need to start respecting the earth and each other. Um, renewable is, 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 is great if we can do that, but we need to demand it. We need to demand that more uh, as a collective, as a species. Um, we For sure, whatever we are doing as consumers here in this country is going to be affecting other countries and other indigenous peoples. Organic agriculture is viewed by uh, Agricultural Canada as unsustainable because it doesn't, you know, it has, you need the pesticides to, to keep the bugs away and the bugs are flourishing. We're losing uh, a lot of our trees and uh, medicines to invasive species. Um, it is a topsy-turvy world and we need to be aware of that because we need to give the, the a fighting chance to the people and if we don't try um, maybe one day there'll be a list of names on a wall that says these are the people that could have done something and they didn't and we know in history um, we, we, we learn from history uh, the fact that indigenous people um, continue to resist after five centuries um, uh, of dealing with that kind of mentality that came here. Uh, I think it's, it's a reflection that there is a lack of political will. They are not interested in our rights. They're not interested. Uh, they're not interested in becoming assimilated into indigenous people's way of, of thinking. And, and we need to assimilate. We have to assimilate them for the sake of the planet. And so I guess I'll end there. Uh, thank you very much again for inviting me and I appreciate this opportunity. And they go on again. Miigwech, Ellen. Uh, only Ellen could end on a, let's all assimilate <laughs> message. <laughs> I, 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 if we just took a little clip there of, we all need to assimilate. <laughs> uh, no, I really love that. And I particularly um, really appreciate you talking about the, um, I think oftentimes we forget of how all of our elders that have created this space in order for us to be here tonight, for example, or in the Twitterverse, and and how important it is that many of our uh, many of those who are at the front lines now, many young activists particularly, and how important it is to hear from the elders that have uh, really made us here in this space possible. I think of everything that an elder once said to me was that everything we ever needed is right here and it's right here in this space. We don't need anything else. And so we, so it's not that we shouldn't dream and we shouldn't create and we shouldn't in, innovate, but is that we have to remember that everything that we needed is right here. We, it's right here present amongst us. And so, um, so I love that message. Uh, there's so much in the chat here. I just wanna point it out. We only have a few minutes remaining, uh, but there's a lots of message of solidarity, lots of message of appreciation for Kakike, as well as Sadie and you, Ellen. Um, and uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass it over to Leah uh, here, who's organized the event. Um, Leah, from the messages that you've heard for tonight, um, in the different speakers, and, and maybe what we could do is bring in uh, the speakers for uh, for any other last messages here. But Leah, from the things that you've heard tonight, what are some of the biggest um, uh, challenges, but also some of the opportunities that you're seeing within people who are doing frontline activism and, uh, and how some of these visions could perhaps, including 
uh, assimilation that Ellen talked about, uh, bringing mainstream society, which is the, the methods in which we're to save the planet. We owe it to the planet to bring Indigenous values, Indigenous rights to the surface. What are things that you're finding in maybe some of the larger work that you're doing and maybe some of the work that you're doing uh, in your office as well with grandma, for example? Well, I mean, I first I, you know, I don't want to uh, take away voices. I think what this forum has provided is that we need to lift up voices. Uh, you know, particularly uh, being uh, in, a, in a place that's very colonial that excludes voices. We certainly see that in, in some of the discussions that uh, the, the brilliance, uh, you know, it's just so lovely. Uh, the brilliance uh, here that that voices uh, need to be uplifted and we need space for voices, but then we need to respond with action. Um, you know, uh, always appreciate, uh, you know, Kaki K, uh, your uh, strength and resilience, uh, Sadie and uh, Ellen, you know, uh, I mean, the, the kind of wisdom that you provide is wonderful, but people need to go beyond listening. We need to act. Uh, you know, as Ellen uh, pointed out, we have, you know, six years, six years to get it together. We are in a climate emergency uh, and we are running out of time. And, you know, I think, you know, Ellen provided a very clear picture, uh, you know, of, of where the, the earth is at right now and the kind of choices um, that we need to make to respect uh, our mother earth, our mother and the water. It's about relationships. You know, we talk about reconciliation. Well, we need to also reconcile our relationship with mother earth and our waters and our sky because mother earth does not need us and it has been an abusive relationship and we need to respect a kinder relationship and i think you know the speakers tonight sadie khaki k and and ellen um grandma uh have offered up uh ways of nurturing that relationship and that includes holding people to account, but also doing our part in terms of mitigating this climate emergency. So I don't, I don't think I have really answers. I think, you know, this is, we need a, a collective movement. Um, we need a movement of people moving together in a way that respects Mother Earth, respects our water and our skies, because we are running out of time. Um, and there are solutions. You know, I, I really appreciate um, what uh, Ellen said about assimilating. You know, <laughs> maybe sometimes when we look at power structures, maybe we need to look beyond, you know, I know it's a reality that Indigenous people have been left homeless and poor in our very own lands, but we are still rich in ideas and solutions. Uh, since time immemorial and sometimes that takes humility and I think at the time that we are at now there's no more time to waste it's time to listen with action uh, we talk about uh, reconciliation this will be my last call uh, we talk about reconciliation and they talk about um some people say recommendations. It's not calls to recommendations. It's calls to action, right? We talk about the National Inquiry into murders and, and missing Indigenous women and girls. They don't say it's, it's called to stay complacent knowing that this is going on. It's called calls to justice. So I think I want to thank uh, everybody tonight, including uh, Negon and Grandma and Alana, um, for your words uh, this evening. Uh, and I encourage everybody to really listen with your heart, which what has been shared tonight and respond with action. And I will be there uh, waiting uh, and continuing to act. Uh, so thank you so much.
Is that and your look. is that your uh, child, Negon? She's my <laughs> new baby. This, <laughs> she was born during the pandemic, and she's been. She's like her and I are like one. So, um, so miigwech to everybody for a beautiful night. Um, and in fact, her name is Nibby, by the way. So Nibby, which is water. So uh, my daughter named her. Um, so I, I just want to, before we go back to grandma and grandma uh, to close off tonight, I wish we had more time. I mean, as usual, these things always go so fast. Uh, but grandma runs a uh, community focus group. Uh, so on climate change and every Wednesday at 6 p.m. April 13th and April 20th, the registration link is in the chat. And I think that we had a slide maybe that there was um, going to be popped up. I'm not sure if that's uh, still going to happen or not. But um, but if you want to register for that, uh, you get a chance to spend some time with grandma and uh, Leah's team. Uh, oops, there we go. <laughs> uh, and so um, check it out. It'll be a really important event. I want to say miigwech to uh, Sadie, Kaki Kay, and Ellen, uh, of course, and Leah for inviting me. Uh, I want to thank, say thanks to Alana as well. And so we'll pass it back to Grandma to uh, close off the circle for tonight. Grandma? Okay. I, I'd like to close with um, just the story of, um, of how it was for my father while he was growing up and um, maybe... Um, um, you, you'll learn from it. But the way he was, he wasn't taught in the education system. He was taught uh, on the land. So he, he had to go in the morning, in the morning till sun, sunset, but he'd eat in between. But it, like my great grandparents made him listen to the land, listen to everything that was like, you know, the the birds, the trees, the grass, and all that. And he would sit there and listen. And, and when he listened, like, you know, it's, it was almost like he said, my girl, I could hear the grass grow. Like, you know, and like, you know, that's how, that's how it was for our old people. Like, you know, we were out on the land. We didn't have an electricity. We didn't have running water and all of that we were able to function on the land and true mother earth's hurting. And I really wanna thank Kaki Kay. Her words were just really powerful. Like all your actions, like you, you're just tremendous at all the work that you do. And like, you know, your little girl was right there with you at Tiny House, uh, you know, with the warriors. And like, you know, she, she heard them. She, she heard that what happened there like, you know, because she was inside of you. And then to Sadie, like, you know, your three questions there, like, you know, uh, how are they going to um, ask, ask yourself, are you going to be passive? Are you going to be, are you going to be active? Or are you going to be complicit? Like, you know, those are good questions to the people here. And then Ellen, like, you know, I, I, all you had to say just reflected what our ancestors said in the past. And it, it's always going back. It's all it goes full circle all the time. Like, you know, and that's the way Mother Earth is. She's, you know, after we destroy her, nobody's around. She's going to go full circle and then she's going to bloom and flourish again. We got to stop doing what we uh, were doing to her. But I, I like the idea of we have to assimilate the rest of society. You know, we, we've been trying to do that. Like our ancestors been trying to do that. And I think it's time for, for for our society to listen. So with that, I just want to close uh, by saying you're welcome to join our focus groups. The link's in there. Uh, we'll be meeting next week on the 13th and on the 20th. Stephen Heyrich will be there and uh, Carrie from Cairo. So. We welcome you. I want to close with a prayer and offer prayers to Nokomus, Nokomus's Mother Earth. Wuju Kichmantu Kishapishkoya Danishnikas, Weweta Kwe Makonodam. I come to you in prayer today, grandfathers, grandmothers, and I ask that you continue to protect our, our mother, our Nokomus because she's the one that brings us that life. She's the one that brings us that air and that warmth. 
and she is so strong and I just want to say that I'm so grateful and to her and all that she gives to us we just really love her for what she she brings so in closing I just want to say to me which for all this knowledge and words and the speakers for Patty Kay for Sadie and Ellen Leah and Megan and and most of all, I want to say Jimmy Gwich to uh, Elena. She worked really hard to uh, put this event on. So I say Jimmy Gwich, I go say. Okay, so miigwech to grandma for tonight. Uh, miigwech to everyone for tonight for coming. Uh, it's so inspiring to see uh, uh, you know, dedicated, uh, interested, engaged people in our community. Um, and so I really appreciate seeing everyone. And uh, it's just really nice to see my relatives. It's been, a, you know, you, when you're at home for so long, you forget how powerful it is to be around people and how to, powerful it is, how much the spirit of community really nourishes you. So um, miigwech to everybody for tonight. And uh, I understand this will be uploaded on YouTube soon enough with some closed captioning. So uh, good luck. I don't know if Alana, um, was there any, anything else that needed to be done? I've gotten to the end of the program. So we're in the blank space now. So, okay, I'm getting the thumbs up. All right, so so I'll say miigwech to everyone. Uh, take good care, uh, please be safe. And I hope that if, uh, if you or your family are out there to get vaccinated uh, at any time soon, I hope that you have good health and that you could take good care of yourself. Um, I, uh, my, my vaccination appointment is next week, so I'm quite excited about it. So miigwech, everybody, uh, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Giga wabin minua.